when I came to Canada, I wanted to continue my passion and play cricket. It was there. So I was, again, I found few people like in my area, I started playing table ball, cricket and stuff. You are the captain now. We are going to the World Cup after it's the first T20 World Cup. Uh, it's like a dream come true for us. It was our dream to represent Canada in a World Cup. So making it to a, a World Cup this time, it's a great feeling, something that we have really worked hard for. And there's been many opportunities in the past where like we went through qualifiers and we couldn't make it. Like GT20 with my parents came with this season ki GT20. Dekhne. So I was playing alongside Shahid Afridi. So when I played the game Vancouver ke against, I bowled two really good overs and I won my team the game. So Shahid Afridi told me to my mom that we are going to win today. We have to do a day job and then we have to train in the evenings and play games on the weekend. It, was, it has been quite a tough journey and to come to a point where now we can play full-time cricket and focus on cricket. My message to the youngsters would be to believe in hard work and believe in consistency. Adab, namaste, satsriyakal. Hello and welcome to the Truth Tribe Show. I'm your host, Ravi Thur, and today is a big day for us. As we are discussing the sport of cricket with none other than the skipper of Canada's cricket team, Saad bin Zafar. Saad bhai, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ravi. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to have you here. So for those of you who don't know Saad, Saad is an international cricketer and is currently the captain of Canada's national team who recently qualified for the upcoming T20 World Cup in 2024, which is going to be played in Caribbean and USA. He has played more than 121 games, scored more than 1,000 runs and 150 plus wickets. Saad performs as an all-rounder. He's a left-handed batsman and a left-arm orthodox spin bowler. He was a stellar performer in the Global T20 Canada League and an integral part of the championship-winning Vancouver Knights. He was adjudged the man of the match in the final. Saad also holds the world record for completing his maximum quota of overs without conceding a single run in a men's T20i match and has the seventh most maiden overs bowled in a T20i career. A true dedicated sportsman and an inspiration for many of us. Super excited to have you here, Saad Bhai. I thought for our session today, there's a lot of different avenues we can take. But what I wanted to ask you is when you think about your childhood and as it relates to cricket, what is your most favorite memory that comes to your mind? Who are you with? What are you doing? And why is it special for you? So if I look at my childhood memory, it's about me playing with my friends in my backyard. I used to live in a hospital. My dad was a doctor, so we had a residence inside the hospital. So I had a big lawn and I was actually in the beginning was not allowed to go outside and play. So I was only allowed to play within my house. So I would call all my friends over and especially on the weekend, on, on Saturdays and Sundays, we'll just play the game of cricket. So I think that's where I actually started playing cricket. And that's where my passion of cricket initiated. So that's if I were to look back in my journey, those memories are still in my mind. It's just as a youngster growing up, as a kid, you just want to have a good time. And cricket was an expression of a good time with friends. So that's a memory for me. And that was the beginning of my passion into cricket. And I think that's the reason why it's so special. That's lovely. And I'm sure all of us can relate to it because that's where we all start in your backyard, in your streets, before you go on and play in the stadiums. A follow-up to that is growing up or even now, who have you looked up as your role model or inspiration in cricket? Growing up, it was uh, Wasim Akram. And uh, the reason was I was a left hand a batsman and a baller too and I was a fast baller in the beginning because we used to play with tennis ball and tape ball and there's no concept of spin balling in, in tennis ball or tape ball. He was an inspiration for us and he was the big name when I was growing up. So I used to copy his action and people used to compliment me by saying, oh, you look for C. Makram. That would encourage me to even do better as a left arm uh, fast baller. So growing up, he was an inspiration for me and in the beginning, he was my role model, someone I would follow. That's awesome. I've grown up watching Wasim Akram and he's the legend of the game. I still go around and try to mimic the left arm <laughs> action your upbringing as a cricketer. So I believe you started most of your professional cricket when you came to Canada at 17 years old. Can you walk us through what was the moment that started your career, cricketing career? Where did it all start? So to start with, my journey is pretty, it's not similar to most of the cricketers who who would say that, oh, I started from club cricket and junior level cricket, got into coaching and 
came up through the ranks. Mine was very different. I never thought I could come to a point where I could turn cricket, which is my passion, into a profession. And if I could ever even play at the national level or represent Canada, I had no thoughts of that. It was just a visual thinking, which developed over time. But even initially, as brown parents, my dad was more focused of me focusing on studies and getting a career. So he always tried to keep me away from cricket as much as he can. So for me, it was never in, even in my mind that, oh, I would want to become a cricketer one day because I thought that cannot happen. And then even in Pakistan, it's not that I was playing club cricket or anything. I was just playing on the street and I played at the school level. I got picked in a school team and then I represented my school. So when I moved to Canada, even when we moved to Canada, the main purpose of the whole family migrating to Canada was to me get into university and get a good education and then find a good career and then live my life. So basically, even when I moved to Canada, it was not that, oh, I have to look for cricket and I have to start playing club cricket. It just happened along the way. So I, when I came to Canada, I wanted to continue my passion and play cricket. It was there. So I was, again, I found few people in my area. I started playing table cricket and stuff. And then I was in grade 12 and I was doing a summer school, summer job. I was in a telemarketing place and I overheard someone talking about going and doing net cricket nets after the work. So I approached them and I asked them, can I join you guys? I play cricket as well. And then they said, yeah, sure, come along. And then I went with them and I bowled in the nets and they really liked me. And then they told me that, oh, we play for a club. There's a, there's club cricket that's being played here. Why don't you come and uh, join our club? And that's how basically I joined the club and my club cricket journey started. But then again, the focus was still studies and uh, making sure that I get into university after grade 12 and I get good grades to enough to get into a reputable university. So club cricket started, I was uh, 17 at that age. So I joined the club and I, they put me in the under 19 team and then I did well in the under 19 team. Then they put me in um, a first division team, which is uh, the premier division was the highest division at that point. And first division was a division below that. The first game I played in the pre first division team, I took five wickets and then they, those guys said that, oh, you need to be in our premier team. So they put me in premier team right away. And then all of a sudden I was playing in my first year, I was playing the top level cricket league in one, one of the best uh, teams, which was overseas back then. So I started playing club cricket right away after that. But then even when I started playing club cricket, I didn't think that I, I'm good enough to <laughs> represent Canada at any point. So it was just out of passion. And then I got into university. And then after, I think, two or three years, I pulled my back muscles and I had back spasm and stuff. So I stopped bowling fast. Uh, and then I turned into a spinner. Then my spin bowling became better and effective. And then after a few years, in 2008, I got a call up for the Canadian national team. So I, all of a sudden, from, I was representing Canada in 2008. I was playing a four-day game against Bermuda. That's how my journey started. But again, I didn't become a regular member of the team. It was just uh, the start and I just played two games and then uh, I was being rested. But then that was the first time when I realized, okay, then maybe I'm good enough to play uh, at the Canada level. I feel in my mind that I was not ready for the opportunity. It came a little too early for me, but gave me a thought of what needs to be done to, to grab my opportunity again when it comes to me, basically. So that's where the whole uh, mind shift started, basically, that, oh, I can, maybe I'm good enough to play Canada. I need to focus more on, on cricket. Very interesting. So a question on that. Do you recall the first game that you played in Canada, Jersey, what kind of emotions were running through you? Can you take us back to that day? Yeah, so that was against Bermuda in Canada, that where I did my debut in 2008. It was a four-day game, list first class, which is called first class, our version of a test match. Yeah. So when I was being told that I'll be representing Canada, I'll be playing for Canada, I know a night before, I was just so excited and I couldn't fall asleep, but then even in the morning, two of my teammates came to pick me up because we were going to drive to King City. I used to live in Scarborough back then. And then it just, the whole journey was surreal. I had butterflies in my stomach and I didn't really expect, I, it didn't feel real to me. 
So it was an awesome moment for me, something that I would cherish. And then when I went and I, I met all the national players and, and I remember Ian Billcliffe and John Davison were the big names uh, of Canadian cricket back then. And then I was presented with the Canadian national cap. So those are great uh, moments. It just felt surreal to me at that point. That's wonderful. And John Davison, if, correct me if I'm wrong, he was a superstar in the 2003 World Cup. Is that correct? That is correct. And the, he scored the fastest century of the World Cup back then. And he was well known because of that achievement. Yeah, I remember that match actually. And that's what, oh, Canada plays cricket too. So I think, who would you consider? You said you started out at 17 and then you got your chance, maybe a little bit early. Who would you consider were your mentors and coaches throughout this journey of yours? Who are the people that you go for advice? So basically, again, I was a self-taught person. I never joined any coaching before that. And so I didn't come through the coaching system. So everything I learned just by watching and playing cricket. And at a later stage, even after playing Canada, I realized the importance of coaching and the whole science of doing drills and how coaching is done. And basically that I learned at a very later age. But during that time, when I was playing cricket, I had a mentor, Rizwan Chima, because I used to play with him. I played under his captaincy a lot at the club level. There was a, a time when I used to live with him as well. So I would go and train with him. Predominantly, he would bat and I would bowl. So mostly I was working on my bowling when I was with him. But he was the go-to person for any advice and any suggestions back then. So he was my mentor for a very long time. He's another big name, a stellar performer in Canadian cricket circuit. So shout out to Rizwan Chief, Canada Cricket. You are the captain now. We are going to the World Cup. after It's the first T20 World Cup. What does it mean for you to represent Canada at an international stage? What kind of responsibility is on your shoulder, especially being a skipper as well? Definitely, it's a dream come true for us. All of us in the squad, it was our dream to represent Canada in a World Cup. So making it to a World Cup this time, it's a great feeling, something that we have really worked hard for. And there's been many opportunities in the past where we went through qualifiers and we couldn't make it. So it was a, a test of patience as well, where we were, when is it going to be our chance of making our dream come true? So it has finally come true. So we're really happy uh, about that. But then again, that doesn't end there. It's just the start of the journey, what I feel is. And I think World Cup is an opportunity where you can go and you can showcase your talent and skill and you can put your country's uh, flag there where other people see your potential and they respect you. Yes, I understand that we are not expected to win the World Cup participating in it for the first time, but we're there to learn and play at the competitive level and also earn some respect out of the other countries where they can play against us and they can say that these guys are good. And then in a few years, if they are given the right opportunities, and right environment, these guys can thrive because we have seen a lot of associate countries that come through the ranks and they're at a point where they're competing against some of the top nations. Afghanistan is one of the those countries. Netherlands is the other one. Ireland, they came through the associate ranks. Now they have a test status. So it's not that we will be doing something that has never been done before. So the pathway is there. We just want to follow that pathway and come to a point where we can be one of the top playing cricket countries in the world. So this is just a start, I believe. And again, when you make it to the World Cup, ICC gives your board access funding to, to prepare for the World Cup. So now we will be getting more funding where we can use those fundings to get extra preparation. So we'll have training tours. We'll go to countries, test playing countries, Sri Lanka tour is planned where we will get more competitive training and games to get better basically. So it's a start. And then I think the next eight months we'll spend in touring some of these countries where we will play competitive cricket to get better and then showcase our best potential on the world stage. And then also it will then bring eyeballs to Canadian cricket. A lot of people, even in Canada, still don't know that we have a team, we have a national team and then how do we play? But then when people see us performing at that world stage, I think it will generate interest and it will give more eyeballs to Canadian cricket, which will, in return, it will be good for cricket in Canada. Yeah, one, 100%. And I think we need that kind of exposure. We definitely have the talent. It's just when we have, as you said, now we get extra funding. I think I was reading this morning, actually, the Canadian players are now contracted for the first time as well with proper salary. So it's not, back in the days, we call them weekend warriors, right? Because you can only play in weekends and you have full-time jobs, just with most of the associate nations. But now 
to have that solid foundation to actually be able to just focus on cricket that is going to change how we go about it no, yeah i was going to add to that because i have lived that life and we all have lived that life we have played for canada we have to do day job and then we have to train in the evenings and play games on the weekend it has been quite tough journey and to come to a point where now we can play full time cricket and focus on cricket it's a great achievement and i believe again it's just a start maybe if not in our generation the younger generation i think there'll be a time when they come into this sport they can not just make the full time income but they can make ample amount of money and fame where they can live a good life and they can proudly say that cricket is a well paid career it's not something where what we have grown up seeing that or oh, this is just again a weekend warrior thing where you just you have your own career and, and just play cricket on the side so it so things are changing and things are changing for the better 100% and just to add on to that as well and i think a lot of people don't know this so it's just some history for people cricket is actually one of the oldest sports played in canada it originates back i believe to correct me if i'm wrong i think it's 1785 and to add on to that the first canadian prime minister john a macdonald actually made cricket as the first national sport of canada so cricket was the first national sport of canada before hockey and everything else so it's just some little history lesson for everybody out there but can you take us back to the tournament the world cup qualifiers I know the first game you guys I saw this little clip that you shared on the internet where you guys lost the first game to Bermuda and the emotions that went into it and then you guys came back and actually won the game and qualified for the World Cup. What were the emotions going into the game and then once you qualified what was the dynamic in the team? Yeah, so in the past we have had played couple of qualifiers which we lost very closely at the end. So in this qualifier we were really looking forward to it and again we put our heart and soul into the preparation side of things so going into the tournament and being beaten on the first day on on the first game and being beaten quite badly it it brings all the negativity and self doubts in your mind that oh would we be again missing this chance of qualifying for the world cup and our dream will not get fulfilled so those negative thoughts started creeping in but it was very important for us to stay positive because it was just the start of the tournament and we had to give ourselves the best chance and focus on the upcoming games in the beginning it was tough but then we had to overcome all those uh, negativity and self doubts that were popping in and we stayed positive and we said look we have to give our best and we have to focus on one game at a time we have to have self belief that we can pull it off from here it's not over yet and in cricket we use that term it's not over until it's over so it was a test of that for that but easy to say but then when you're walking through it and when you have to actually do it it takes a lot of courage and self commitment quickly we realized that and from after that one bad loss we on every single game we focused one game at a time one ball at a time and we fought together as a team and we stayed positive throughout every game and then came down to the last day against Bermuda it was the final for us but then before that last game there was a tropical storm that was passing through Bermuda and there was also a chance of game getting rained out and in that scenario Bermuda would have qualified so we were praying and hoping to go on as well to have the game at least to give us a chance of making it to the world cup luckily the game did happen and we were able to win that game and then finally when the game finished it was a sense of relief for us it was a very emotional moment for us as well our dream actually came true where we finally made it to the world cup and now that we'll be able to go and play represent canada at a stage which we all wanted to represent and play so it was an emotional moment we were some guys were actually in tears and we were hugging each other we were yelling our lungs out some of us lost our voices So it was a great moment and those are the moments you actually play for and every time you get these kind of moments all the hard work and sweat that goes behind in in throughout the preparation and you feel that has paid off and it also sometimes it gives you a nostalgic feeling as well where you see how things started and you would talk to each other that this is our goal and this is what we need to do and then when once you achieve that goal all those trainings and hard work that you have done they run through your mind that you have done to achieve this so it's a blissful feeling actually well deserved to you and and the team and and kudos to you being the skipper and congratulations to cricket canada i think it's we are on a good tra- trajectory and uh, future hold great things for cricket canada so thanks for sharing that moment with us what is the dynamic of the cricket team there's 11 of you plus extras staff support staff who is the entertainer of the team 
who keeps up the group motivated. Yes, Canada is known for its multiculturalism and diversity. So we have players from different cultures in different parts of the world. So just because people are from different cultures, they go about things in a different way. So some people, people, especially from Caribbean, they're more into the fun side of things, party wise, they bring that kind of flavor into the team. People from South Asia, especially even in India, Pakistan, there are divisions where I guess from India, people from South, they're more more educated, they follow the etiquettes and everything. People from the north side, the Punjab side, they're more into fun loving and they don't really care about etiquette. So it's a mix when everybody comes together. It's a lovely, it creates a lovely atmosphere because you are different, but at the same time, you're all one and you have one objective. So it's a great environment overall in the team. And I would say just to name a few, we have about around, I think nine or 10 guys from Ontario, five or six guys from Vancouver, BC. We have one or two guys from Alberta and then one guy from Quebec. So that's pretty much the dynamic of the team at the moment. And then the fun loving guys, I, I would say one is Ravinder Paral Singh. He's from BC. He's always into cracking jokes and dancing around. And I also think AJ with Aaron Johnson, again, out of BC is another, he brings that Caribbean flavor, but he's uh, that kind of a guy as well who would make light of things and would crack jokes here and there. So those are the two guys I would say were the life of the team. I think that kind of talks about Canada as a country, right? Canada, everybody is an immigrant and you all come together and we make this beautiful, diverse mesh of people that we have. So that's good to, that's good to know. Going into the World Cup, you're six, seven months away from it. What does the preparation look for you guys? Are you guys doing anything extra? What does the next seven months bring? Yeah, right now for the next two months, we are here in Canada and we're just training indoors for cricket. Cricket Canada partnered up with CSIO, which stands for Canadian Sports Institute of Ontario, which is the Pan Am Center where all the Olympics train and uh, all the national athletes train for strength and conditioning. So we go there two times a week for our strength and conditioning. And then two times, two to three times, we are training indoors right now here in Ontario. And then from January, we will start going outdoors. So we have our, I think, Sri Lanka tour planned for training in Sri Lanka. And then from there, we have in February, we have our ODI series against UAE and Scotland in UAE, in Dubai. We may go there early and we may play a couple of games with Scotland. And then after the 50 over series, we may even have a T20 series with them as well, Scotland and UAE. And then after that, I think they have planned to go to USA for Aughty Cup and a few other tournaments. Starting from January, we'll be outdoors traveling around and playing competitive cricket leading up to the World Cup. So a fully packed schedule going leading up to the World Cup. The global overseas T20 leagues, they have definitely changed the dynamic of world cricket. You've been a part of GT20 in Canada, which has been a blessing for Canadian cricketers. You've been part of the Caribbean Premier League, the Qatar League, MCL, and many more. What kind of exposure and experience does that bring for our cricketers, including yourself? I think that's the best thing that can happen to any cricketer. I think when you play in those leagues, you play against the top cricketers of the world. And it's an opportunity for you to learn and grow from. You cannot ask for any, I think, higher form of competitiveness than these franchise cricket leagues. I think it puts you in that uncomfortable position where you're bowling against or batting against some of the best players of the world. And especially in a T20 format, which is fast paced, they're coming after you. It tests your skills a lot. It exposes a lot of shortcomings in your game. It gives you uh, an opportunity to learn from it and then grow from it. Also, at the same time, when you do well, some of these top level coaches, when they compliment you for your level of cricket, I think it, it's a great confidence booster. Apart from that, when you go and play these franchise leagues, they give you good money. So in terms of that as well, financially, as cricketers, you want to play those leagues because that generates revenue for you. So overall, I think it's a great platform for any cricketer to be part of. And it's a great learning experience. And you cannot ask to play better competitive cricket than some of these franchise cricket offers. Uh, 100%. And I think franchise cricket is the future of cricket. We are going to have international cricket, but I think franchise cricket is going to take over. So during the franchise cricket in GT20, you got Shahid Afridi out for a golden duck. You bowled to the formidable Yuvraj Singh. 
Chris Gale mentioned your innings in the final as one of the best by a Canadian cricketer. You have shared partnership with Shoaib Malik, Andre Russell, and those are some legends of the game. What has been your most cherished moment through GT20, if you have to name one? To be honest, all the things that you have mentioned, they're all cherishable moments for me. And I still remember all those moments, uh, whether it's bowling my first ball to Juvraj Singh, or whether it's me getting Shaila Fridi out on the first ball, and whether it's playing that innings in the finals that I've played. They're all cherishable, very hard to pick any one of them. And then all these memories that I've created, I think uh, every time I create these memories, like I feel I have done justice to my career. When you are focusing on cricket, those doubts come in your mind, whether you're taking the right decision of quitting your job and playing cricket. And then every time these memories and things happen, then I feel I've, I've taken the right choice. And those are the memories where I would not trade for any amount of money. A lot of the time, even when I was quitting work and I was focusing on cricket as full time, I understood the fact that I may not have the financial potential of making the same money in, in cricket, which I would have or could have made if I had kept my corporate job, let's say. But then every time these things happen, I feel, you know what, I've made the right choice. And those are the moments that I would not trade for any amount of money or with anyone. So those are, are all cherishable moments. But if I have to pick one to answer your question, I think the first inning in the GT20 final, that was, it holds a very special place in my heart. I've watched some highlights of that innings and it was a masterclass. So great job done there. When you go on these leagues, we're talking about these overseas league and you play a lot of franchise crickets and it's very short term, two weeks here, three weeks there. What is the biggest challenge as a cricketer? Because you're playing with different teams, different coaches. What, do you, what is the biggest challenge and how do you then overcome it? In franchise cricket, I think the biggest challenge is gelling together as a team. Because when you're playing for the national team, your roles, the players you're playing with, how they behave in the ground. So it's easier to, to gel and play with them. But when you come in a franchise cricket, it's very tough because you travel. When you get together, you only have a couple of days to then leading up to the first game and then it's probably played over two or three weeks time. So it's game after game and then you don't have enough time to gel in. So I think that transition into gelling in and being one unit, because at the end of the day, it's a team sports. It's not individual sports. So you can be a great player, but if you're not a good team player, then it's always tough to gel in and play your role in a game. I think that's probably the toughest part, but I think the more leagues that's been played around the world, players have gotten used to it and they understand that part of aspect as well. And now just because so many leagues are happening, a lot of players play uh, together in similar teams. So they've been, over the time they've known each other as well. I think cricket has become a global platform where you get to play against players from all over the world. So it's no more where it's just a rivalry between countries. You come together and you play in the same team with players from all over the world. So I think that's the transition of gelling into a team is, I would say, is a challenge. But as players, now we understand that and we try to understand each other, how each other uh, behave and plays in the team and then come together and focus on doing the right things on the field, basically. Yeah, and as you said, rightly, with so much cricket happening around the world, you're talking to the players, maybe not in your team, but off the field as well, right? There's a conversations going on. You're still all players, cricket fraternity sharing those experiences. You've been in the cricket circuit for quite some time. Now you also have exposure of playing all these overseas franchise cricket leagues. If you have to rate top three things that we need to bring to Canada cricket, to improve the state of cricket, what would those three changes be and why? So one of the things would be in terms of the infrastructure, I believe we need more grounds, proper grounds, cricket grounds, potentially and ideally stadiums. Because I believe the more, if you have more cricket grounds and cricket stadiums, you can host some of these leagues, GD20 leagues, or even international games where Canada is playing another country, where you create that atmosphere, you have proper infrastructure for people to come and, and enjoy the game as well. Because right now we don't have any stadiums, proper stadiums. So you need to, you need fan engagement. You want a youngster to have a, have a experience he can get inspired by and he can be oh, I want to play in this ground or in this league as well when I grow up you create that kind of an inspiration because I think all of us growing up got that inspiration 
from back home in our countries where we went out as a kid, we went to a stadium, we enjoyed the atmosphere, we enjoyed the whole experience and that actually generated interest, not just by looking at in a TV, but the real life of us going into a stadium and enjoying that moment and having that thought in our mind that, oh, maybe one day I can grow up to become a cricketer and play in this ground and represent a country or a franchise cricket league as well. So I think we need to work on our infrastructure and we need to create those kind of stadiums and, and grounds where kids can come in and they can enjoy the atmosphere and have that inspiration to, to play cricket at a higher level. I understand that because we live in Canada, we have a very small window of summer where we can play cricket. Off season, we need to work to either build maybe some proper indoor facility. It could be an indoor dome where we can practice and train or create Especially for the national team, you have to create ways where they can keep playing competitive cricket all year round. You can have a partnership with the U.S. where you can fly to places Miami or, or Houston, some of those areas where you can play competitive cricket in wintertime as well. That would be another thing I think that's needed uh, and to be worked on. The third thing would be to work on a grassroots level where you introduce cricket to school system and have renowned academies where you can focus on kids and then grow them from there so you can have a wider pool of players to pick from when it comes to uh, picking the national sites. I still believe we rely a lot on immigrants where people who have played cricket in, in India, Pakistan, Caribbean, they come in and once they qualify to represent Canada, then you pick uh, most of the players from them. I think we need to start uh, focusing on the grassroots level where we can have Canadians who are starting cricket at a young age and they come up the ranks and then they go on to be as competitive and they can represent Canada as well. Basically, I think those are the three things we need to work on. I, I think you hit the nail on the head with all those things, right? Infrastructure is, we need infrastructure, I think. And maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, but Brampton probably passed the approval of the new cricket stadium that they're going to build. So that's, again, a step in the right direction. That's the first of it. And we need more collaboration. As you said, we have six seven months of winter. I was thinking about back in the days, Australia used to have those dome stadiums, right? Being the captain of the Canadian team, what kind of responsibility is on your shoulders and how do you motivate and manage the boys? I, yeah, so as a leader, I think I have to take care of a lot of things because I'm responsible of making decisions on the field. I have a responsibility to make sure that I'm reading the game and I'm in the state of mind where I'm understanding the game and making the right decisions. At the same time, on and off the field, I have to make sure that everybody's on the same page because you're as strong as your weakest link and cricket is the team sport. It's a chain where even if there's one weak link, that's just enough to break the chain basically. So you have to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Nobody's slacking or nobody's in a different state of mind. And if there's anybody who needs help or who you feel are not on the right track, I have to make sure that I communicate with them and try to understand and pick their brains and see where I can come in and help. I have to also make sure that I am doing my role as a cricket player properly because if I'm not justifying my role, then whatever I'm trying to ask the other players, it may not come in a way where they may say that he's asking us to do things, but he's not doing things uh, well himself. So uh, I have to fulfill all the aspects and all the areas of being a leader. I just try my best to make sure that I'm fulfilling all the roles that I'm supposed to do as a leader. And I try to do justice to my role. For me, the only thing in my head is how can I win a game for my country? And that's the only thing that I think of when I'm making a decision. I don't think of making a decision that oh, I have to pick my own favorites in the playing 11 or I have to fulfill friendships here and there. All my decisions are based on what would uh, give Canada the best chance of winning a game. Because that's my mindset. And I think that has earned me respect as well because people have realized it. So people don't doubt me when I make decisions, basically. So those are, I think, those are the things that I'm basically doing at the moment. Love that because you have to walk the talk, right? And then you have to lead by example. And I think you are really setting that example for, for everybody around you as well. And you are the leader of the pack. So when you go in, in a cricketing field, especially when I'm talking about bowl, bowling, so you're bowled against some formidable batsmen. What is your go-to strategy when you're bat bowling against a big name, Shahid Afridi or Yuvraj Singh? What's going on in your head? So my strategy, it's something that I have I've 
spoken to some of the best players in the world and what they have told me. So my strategy is to focus on my strengths. A good ball is a good ball to anybody. Andre Russell told me that. He told me that even when I'm trying to hit a good ball that's pitched at a good length, I'm taking a risk. Anything can happen from there, even though sometimes I'm able to hit that shot from there, but I'm still taking a risk. Uh, so even when I'm bowling to the best of the best, a controllable thing for me is to bowl at a good length and trying to read the situation, what the wicket is doing and what's a good length can be different on different wickets. So if it's a turning wicket, you can come a little closer to the batsman. If the wicket is not turning, it, you have to stay a little backward. The good length then switches to a back of the length delivery. So it changes from, you also have to read the batsman of what his strengths are and where his weak points are. So you adjust your line of length and the pace, you vary the pace accordingly. That's the only thing that's in my control. When somebody hits me off a good ball that I'm trying to bowl, that's a good shot and I cannot do anything about it. And it's okay. My role as a bowler is not to bowl bad balls. I shouldn't be bowling half volleys. I shouldn't be bowling full tosses or really short of length balls. Regardless of which batsman I'm bowling to, I focus on bowling good balls. And I think that's the mantra as a bowler, basically. Cricket is a long game. You've been in the circuit for lots of years. There's a lots of ups and downs. If you have to look back at your career, is there a particular moment that might have been a failure in the moment, but has then helped you to succeed? Do you have a favorite failure of yours? Favorite failure would be in CPL. The second game I played against was against St. Kitts. And I bowled in the power play one over. I was bowling against Evan Lewis and he smashed me for 21 runs in that over. As a left arm spinner, it's always tough to bowl against a left hand batsman. That was a failure to me and I didn't get uh, a game after that. I didn't get any over in that game as well after that. But then I realized I need to make better plans and better variations bowling, especially to left-hander batsmen. And if ever there's an opportunity that comes again and I'm put in the similar situation, I have some go-to balls. After that, I've worked on a few things before. I would only come around the wicket, even to the lefties. Now I've also started then developing changing the angles and bowling over the wicket to the lefties as well and adding a few more deliveries to my armory. So I think that would be one failure that I learned from and I grew from. I, I love that. And part of why I asked this reason is a lot of times people, oh, it's a linear trajectory, it's up, up. That's not the case. There's a lot of downs. You learn from the downs and the people who are the most successful is because they learned and, and fixed those things. And there's actually more, more down than up, especially in life and in cricket as well. We go through a lot of, especially downtime, there's a lot of failures. And I think if you want to succeed in any profession, I think failure should be your best friend. You have to learn from it. You should not shy away from a tough situation where there is a high risk of you failing. Because I think when you expose yourself to these high risk situations, tough situations, that's when you come out of it as a better player and as a better person. And it gives you an opportunity. A failure gives you an opportunity to learn and improve from, right? And some of the best players in, even in the cricketing world, they're great because they're not afraid of failing and they're not afraid of being in the center when the goings get tough, when there's a tough situation. In, we just saw that example of Glenn Maxwell against Afghanistan just now. It was a tough situation and he was cramping and everything, but he never gave up. He wanted, it felt he wanted to be in that situation and he over, overcame that situation. And that's how heroes are created as well. And that's how you become a better player. It's, I know Glenn Maxwell played that inning, but how many cricketers he has given hope to that now as a cricket, you can come out of any situation at any time. He has given that hope. So it's a lesson for people who wants to learn and grow from that innings of his. There's a lesson in that inning for every one of us that you only lose when you give up. You have to keep fighting and keep believing in yourself and, and don't be scared and afraid of failing. It's just a part of life. Yeah, 100%. There's a couple of quotes that come to my mind. It's when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. And as you said, it's not over till it's over. And that's what cricket is about. I remember that game because it happened just a couple of days ago. And I looked at the scoreboard. It was 127 for seven. And I thought it was Afghanistan playing first. And then I looked at him and, oh, wait a minute, it's Australia playing. I'm like, oh yeah, this game is done and dusted. And then people are calling me. Like, are you watching this? But yeah, what a masterclass that was. Yeah. When you were on season, getting ready for the season, getting ready for your games, what does a day of training look for you from start to end? What do you do? How many drills? How much time in the net? 
So we usually train for three hours a session, cricket specific. And then we usually train, I would say three to four times in a week. And then depending on our schedule, if we have games on the weekends, now we have T20 leagues as well. So we also have games during the weekdays as well. I'm just talking about the club cricket in Toronto that I would have probably two games on the weekend and then one or two games uh, during the weekdays as well. And then around that, I will schedule my training uh, routine, but it's bare minimum. It would be three days a week and then it could be more depending on my schedule. I may also have an extra session or two session. And also depending on how good things are going, sometimes I need more time to fix things. If some things are not working for me, I would spend extra time working on those. And if things are going well, then I will just basically have that sort of a maintenance phase where I'm just training enough to stay in, to keep my form, basically. If I have to ask you, what is an underrated aspect of cricket training that you think deserves more attention? Underrated would be to do the basic drills. Basics could be as simple as making sure that you are balanced and stable when you're playing a ball as a batsman. Cricket has changed so much and there's so many shots that, that players have started playing. You tend to, a lot of the time, you tend to lose and be off balance when you're facing a, a baller. So I think it's very important to, to work on the basic drills. And I, again, I'll reference back to Glenn Maxwell where it's one of the basic drills where you just stand stable and you don't move your feet and you just play the ball, the ball with your hands. And he just displayed it on the cricket field on that day because sometimes when you're doing that drills, as a batsman, you feel, I don't really need to do that drill. I just need to go and smash the ball uh, in the nets. But you need those drills to make sure that the hand-eye coordination is working properly. You're balanced, you're stable when you're hitting the ball. And he just displayed it in the game where he was just standing still without moving his feet. He was smashing the ball. So I think that's pretty, very underrated. A lot of the time I see people just going into the nets and they're just, without thinking about anything, they're just going and smashing every ball. It's not about just going and smashing every ball. It's about doing those little basic drills where you're making sure that your head is stable and you're transferring your weight properly into the ball. So those kind of drills are, are very important and one should do regularly do it, basically. Yeah, yeah, very well said. I used to play school cricket and I remember my coach, he always, just what you said, keep your head still. Don't let your head fall off and keep the balance and stay still. You're spot on with that. Um, Sadly, during your career and with every athlete, there's injuries that are part of everyone's career. You went through a couple of back injuries yourself. And I think that's when you came from being a pacer to a spin bowler. Can you walk us through what kind of impact does those injuries have on a mental aspect of a player? And how does one overcome those? I think especially when you're young, you don't really understand the importance of doing proper stretching or strength and conditioning aspect of the game where you have to train your muscles to, to have that strength where they don't break down. It's just because when you're young, the recovery is so fast that even if you do get an injury, you sleep for one night and next day you're recovered. As you age, you understand that once you get injured, the recovery time expands. It's from one night to maybe then five, six nights that you may need. If you are in a tournament, then you may miss a couple of games and you don't want to be in that situation. Just developing that aspect of the game where you are focused on the strength and conditioning part and having eating right and training, having a gym routine and following the exercises that would be sports specific, that would help the muscles that are overused in the game, whether you're a batsman or a baller, specific to your role in cricket. I think you need to train those muscles. So that part should not be overlooked. And I think for youngsters, they should start at an early age and develop the, those habits rather than understanding and realizing it at a later age, especially in Canada, even in the summertime, a lot of the time, cold weather and your body is not properly wound up. And we miss that important aspect of the game. And we just start playing without doing proper warm up and proper stretching. That is what that leads into injury. That's what happened to me in the past when I incurred those injuries. I emphasize a lot on strength and conditioning and doing proper warm-up and doing all these exercises to make sure that I don't carry any injuries that where it's long-term and I have to sit out for a while. Yeah, and I think it's very important, right? Because it's so easy to injure yourself. And every injury is different. Some could be long-term, some could be short-term. And if you're a professional cricketer, you, don't, you do not want to miss any of the games. Sabi, do you have any superstitions? Because a lot of cricketers do have superstitions. Um, 
I've known a few cricketers who do in my team, but I actually do not have any superstition. So I usually, there's always a voice in your head who's trying to tell you something, especially when, let's say for instance, where I'm going into, going in for a toss, there would be a voice in my mind that would tell me, oh, calls tails today or calls ahead today. <laughs> Sometimes I listen to that, but other than that, I don't have any superstition. Yeah. Uh, let's switch gears and I'm going to switch the language with the gears as well, because we're talking about your upbringing. Your upbringing is Pakistan, a few hours away from where I grew up. What was it for you growing up? What dynamic was in your home? What was the place in Pakistan when you grew up? Can you walk us through with that? Dynamic? It was that, again, I was the biggest son, so my dad was very focused on my studies. My dad, bhi, he's a doctor, he's an eye specialist. So, he was in the medical field. Mein, again, that's where he prospered. And then, even when he was in student life, mein the, to, I think he talked in one of the districts of wherever he was studying. Both had me or my dad, he was the eldest in his family. Pressure tha ki ye sabse bade, uh, bachche ka sabse bada, you know, like us tarah ka pressure tha ki ye bhi dad ke, you know, follow up footsteps ko follow kare or maybe he becomes a doctor or an engineer or something. Wo hamesha se pressure rehta tha. Uh, thoda us pe focus tha, but mera ye tha ke, uh, again, mera passion cricket ka tha, to cricket mujhe khelne ka bohut shok tha. Mere dad bhi bohut achche cricketer the. Mere dad bohut achche athlete the. Wo apni university mein I, he was the captain of his cricket team as well as his field hockey team. He was playing, but he was more in his studies. So, in his studies, there were a lot of accomplishments. There was a lot of pressure that I had to stop from cricket. I had to stop from cricket. I had to stop from studies. So, I feel that now I have to feel that if I have to support the cricket side of my cricket side, I have to stop from cricket side. So maybe, especially when you talk about cricket basics. So uh, even now, when I see a lot of children who go to academies, and their parents especially are very supportive, they buy good gears, they give them to their coach, they sit with their coach, they sit with their coach, they observe them. So I think that, you know, like, if I don't have to do all these things, I can play in Canada, then you have to have all the opportunities and all the things in their favor. So they have to have all the opportunities and all the things in their favor. So they have to have all the opportunities. So, उनको एक तरह से एक एडवांटेज है कि वो ये सारी चीजें करके कनाडा को रिप्रेजेंट कर सकते हैं और कंपैटिव क्रिकेट खेल सकते हैं तो तो थोड़ी सी सपोर्ट शुरू में मिसिंग थी बट आई एम अ फॉर्म बिलीवर जिससे होती है तो उस अगर कोई चीज गलत भी हो रही है आपकी लाइफ में और और ऐसी हो रही है जो जो आपके व्यू पॉइंट से ठीक नहीं है वो भी इन अ वे आपको हेल्प कर रही होती है टू टुवर्ड्स अचीविंग योर गोल क्योंकि समटाइम्स हमारे पास चीजें बहुत जल्दी आ जाती हैं और हमें रियलाइज नहीं हम उस चीज को उसका इम्पोर्टेंस भूल जाते हैं और एन बी टेक थिंग्स फॉर ग्रांटेड और हम उसका यूज नहीं कर सकते वेल इनफ टू टू फ्लरिश सो आई आई बिलीव के जो भी हुआ वो वो डेस्टिनी थी टूवर्ड्स मेकिंग मी हु आई एम टुडे सो कोई इट्स नॉट के इट्स इट्स अ कम्प्लेन बट इट्स जस्ट के फील लाइक थोड़ा सा और मुझे शुरू में सपोर्ट होती तो मे बी मुझे जल्दी कुछ चीजें हासिल हो जाती But those were the dynamics. So, then Canada ki immigration bhi usi tarah hi hui ki focus was primarily on my studies. मुझे मेरे dad Canada में छोड़के जा रहे थे. So he mentioned it to me. कि अगर आप PhD किए बगैर अगर आप वापस आए तो I would feel कि मेरी investment हो गई है. So it can be investment for him, right? Because kids are investment for their parents. So even जब वो मुझे ये बोलके जा रहे थे तो भी मुझे लगा कि मेरे से bachelor's शायद मुश्किल से खत्म हो तो he's पता नहीं मास्टर्स भी होगा कि नहीं होगा ही इज टेलिंग मी टू गो एंड डू पी एच डी वो की चीजें थी बट ना हो जब वो देखते हैं कि मैंने कितनी सक्सेस हासिल की क्रिकेट में इट्स अ प्राउड मोमेंट फॉर हिम एज वेल सो ही हैज हिज थिंकिंग हैज चेंज एज वेल ओवर द टाइम और दिस अ लॉट ऑफ मोमेंट्स अभी मेरे लाइक जी टी ट्वेंटी हुई थी मेरे पेरेंट्स आए हुए थे इस सीजन की जी टी ट्वेंटी देखने तो आई वॉज प्लेइंग अलॉन्ग साइड शायद अफरीदी So, जब मैंने पहली गेम वेंकुअर के अगेंस्ट आई बोल्ड टू रियली गुड ओवर्स एंड आई वन माय टीम द गेम तो शायद फ्रीदी ने मेरी मॉम से बोला कि लाइक आपके बेटे की वजह से हम आज मैच जीते हैं सो दो काइंड ऑफ मोमेंट्स इट्स अ प्राउड मोमेंट्स फॉर पेरेंट्स तो आई जस्ट फील आई फील रियली हैप्पी वेन नाउ दैट आई मेड माई पेरेंट्स प्राउड एंड एवरी टाइम समबडी से समथिंग टू माई डैड कि वो वो आपका बेटा क्रिकेट बहुत अच्छा खेलता है एंड एंड ही फील प्राउड अबाउट इट एंड सो आई इन रिटर्न आई फील रियली हैप्पी के चलो ही इज हैप्पी के आई डन समथिंग good in my life as well basically yeah yeah kyunki main aapse puchne wala tha is he happy now <laughs> that you have made it big 
Yeah. Uh, Sadhvi, I want to talk about the cricket in Pakistan, the passion for cricket in Pakistan. बहुत फॉर्चुनेट हूँ जब मैं एडमिंटन में था तो मैं एडमिंटन हमारा क्रिकेट क्लब था एडमिंटन क्रिकेट क्लब और जो मोस्ट लड़के थे हमारे वो पाकिस्तान से थे हमारे कैप्टन सलमान नजीर भाई आई थिंक ही इज द डायरेक्टर ऑफ क्रिकेट कैनेडा एज वेल एंड क्रिकेट एसोसिएशन निजार भाई फ्रॉम स्ट्रैथकोना क्रिकेट क्लब शाउट आउट टू ऑल दो बॉयज उनके साथ रह के मुझे पता चला जो पैशन है क्रिकेट का पाकिस्तान में स्पेशली स्टेप बॉल और जस्ट गली क्रिकेट आप हमें बता सकते हैं आपके नज़रिए से आप जाते हैं आपने क्या देखा है वहाँ पर पाकिस्तान क्रिकेट के अंदर किस तरह का पैशन और जज्बा है वहाँ लोगों में बिल्कुल आई थिंक इट्स नो डिफरेंट देन देन द पैशन एंड जज्बा इन इंडिया बेसिकली सो आई थिंक इट्स प्रिटी मच सिमिलर वी ऑल शेयर दैट सेम पैशन अबाउट क्रिकेट अंदर एक सही है कि क्रिकेट एक तरह से रिलीजन है हमारे कंट्रीज में सो so, बिल्कुल पाकिस्तान में भी ऐसे ही है हमें जहाँ भी जगह मिले शुरू कर दे पास्ट में मेमोरीज ये हैं कि जब भी पाकिस्तान में किसी चीज़ पे स्ट्राइक होती थी रोड्स बंद हो जाती थी तो वो जो रोड्स बंद होती थी उसके अंदर भी लोग आके वो बैट और बॉल लेके वहाँ पे क्रिकेट शुरू कर देते थे तो मैंने भी इवन घर के अंदर क्योंकि मैं आ, मैं अपने लॉन में क्रिकेट खेलता था ज़्यादातर जब बचपन में तो मेरी वो प्लांट्स वगैरह ग्रो करने का बहुत शौक था तो वहाँ पे वो उन्होंने वो पूरे गमले वगैरह रखे होते थे और यू नो प्लांट्स रखे होते थे तो जब मैं वहाँ पे वो शॉट मारता था बॉल ले अब लोग फील्डिंग कर रहे होते थे तो वहाँ से जल्दी से जाके जब बॉल पकड़ के थ्रो करनी होती थी तो कभी किसी प्लांट के ऊपर स्टेप आ गया कोई गमला टूट गया तो हो जाती थी तो उस तरह की चीज़ें बहुत हुई कोई साथ वाले घर में बॉल चली गई वहाँ का शीशा टूट गया तो यू नो वो आके कंप्लेन कर रहे हैं सो so, हमने इस तरह की इन्वायरमेंट में क्रिकेट खेला कि क्रिकेट इतनी पैशन होती थी क्रिकेट नहीं रुक सकती थी तो क्रिकेट तो खेलनी खेलनी है चाहे कोई किसी को बॉल लगे किसी का शीशा टूटे क्रिकेट विल गो ऑन बेसिकली पाकिस्तान में आप जहाँ भी देखोगे वहाँ पर क्रिकेट हो रही होती थी आप इवन कोई फुटबॉल का भी ग्राउंड होगा तो वहाँ पर भी फुटबॉल कम और क्रिकेट ज़्यादा हो रही होगी बेसिकली तो इस तरह की इन्वायरमेंट है पाकिस्तान में और इट्स हर पैशनेटली देखता है तो थिंक अगर ट्वेंटी परसेंट भी कैनेडा में रेप्लीकेट कर सकें तो क्रिकेट विल बिकम द मेन स्ट्रीम स्पोर्ट्स इन कैनेडा बेसिकली जितना पैशन सब कॉन्टिनेंट में है बेसिकली या वन हर एंड मेरी चाइल्ड मेमरीज हैं जब हम गली में क्रिकेट खेलते होते थे हमारे एक नेबर थे अंकल और वो दोपहर में जब खेलते थे तो वो आके हमारी विकेट उठा के ले जाते होते You you still improvise and, and you still keep playing cricket. Another fond memory, especially कभी किसी की शादी होती थी और अगर लेट से कोई वर्ल्ड कप का मैच है या कोई इम्पोर्टेंट मैच है वो शादी डिले हो जाती थी क्योंकि लोग वो टी वी स्क्रीन ढूंढ रहे होते थे कि भाई कहाँ पे हम मैच देख सकते हैं थोड़ा इंपॉर्टेंट टाइम चल रहा है या या बैक इन द डेज बनाए हुआ स्किट लोग लोग गाड़ी में जाके रेडियो ऑन करके कॉमेंट्री सुन रहे होते थे और मिस दैट इवेंट और डिले दैट इवेंट बिकॉज के मैच चल रहा है बेसिकली इतना इम्पैक्टफुल क्रिकेट का इम्पैक्ट बेसिकली है in our lives basically yeah well, 100% and that's why we love cricket so much right because we have been grown up in that environment and again i think if we can replicate that for the newcomers and people in canada as you said if we can bring 20% of that we'll be in a way a different place than we are today when when you came to canada what was your journey your immigrant journey what kind of support did you see from the community through cricket or through just in general in life so when i came to canada it was a different culture different environment a lot of things were different but at the same time a lot of the things were similar as well uh, especially i came into uh, an area it's called thonkiv park in toronto which is a uh, mini pakistan and mini india there's a lot of new immigrants they come in that area first in terms of the transition i didn't feel a lot different cuz i assumed i'll see a lot of gora people <laughs> when i would move to canada when i saw a lot of brown people desi people For, uh, one fun thing is i learned to speak punjabi in canada i knew but i would hear punjabi and i would understand the language when i was in pakistan but i would predominantly speak urdu i never spoke punjabi but then when i moved to canada people would ask me where you from i said i'm from punjab i'm from lahore and then they would start speaking punjabi to me and i'll reply back to them in urdu and they'd be what kind of punjabi are you not speaking in punjabi and then i realized okay you know what <laughs> i am punjabi so i need to learn and start speaking punjabi as well so it was not a big culture shock so that kind of made it easy for me to transition into the new country and then also when i found similar interest where i found people who were were playing cricket and i joined the the cricket club it was a smooth transition for me it was not something which was the day and night different of what i was expecting and then just because cricket was a common interest i found a lot of relationships where uh, 
a lot of established people who would help me with other things, whether it's related to jobs, where they'll find uh, jobs for me, or whether it's in terms of studies where I found, I think cricket was that binding fa factor where it helped me merge into the society and in the community and make more friends. So I think cricket was that uniting factor where it introduced me to near people. I came across different Caribbean culture, uh, people who play cricket here. I made a lot of friends with people from Indian background, because when you coming from Pakistan, how the politics and the dynamics work, you feel, oh, Indian, Pakistani, they cannot live together. So that was the new conce concept to me as well. But when I came and I realized everybody lives here in harmony and peaceful and we're all the same, basically. So those things, but I think, again, I I feel cricket was the unifying factor, basically, in um, me developing, getting into the community and developing all these relationships. Yeah, 100%. And, and sports play a huge part in that. Sadhbhai, when you're not playing cricket or you're not talking about cricket, what else are you doing? What keeps you fresh off the field? Right now, I have a side business. I have a used car dealership. So that kind of keeps me busy as well. And then for me, if I'm not thinking about cricket and off cricket, I usually spend time in, in reading and understanding about personal development, things that I would to improve on in my personality. I usually watch a lot of documentaries. I would read a lot of stuff into that. And I think those are the things basically that is off cricket time for me, basically. A lot of personal development and focusing on the business thing as well. Do you have a favorite book that you would like to share with us? It's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I would, yeah, Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah, that is, awesome. is something that I would recommend. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I've read that book and it's a great read. Sadba, if you can put anything on a billboard for the entire country of Canada to see, what would your message be and why? My message would be to follow your dreams and follow your passion. I feel a lot of the times we, a lot of the times we tend to focus too much on making money. So money becomes our prime source to chase. Whether we're deciding a career or anything, we don't look into the mental health and personal satisfaction and passion coming out of that. We, a lot of the time we decide things on, oh, what can make me more money? And what I've realized is that I think it's very important to, to chase your passion and dream and something that you can draw happiness from rather than, rather than just focusing on money and then being in a, in not a good position where it's affecting your health and your relationships around you, those kind of things. I feel making just to put a random figure, I would say if you're making 50,000 and you are happy and you have time for yourself and you're, you're doing something that you're passionate about, you're in a better position than you making a hundred thousand and not have time in your hand and not have any passion about doing what you're doing. So I think you need to find a balance and focus on doing things that gives you happiness basically in life. That's very important aspect of life that we sometimes don't focus on. And our direction is just, oh, we need to make money to feel happy. And I, and then in the process, you understand that that is not where you draw happiness from. So understand what brings you happiness and what you're passionate about, and then see how you can incorporate that into your life. And if you can incorporate that into a career, that's a win. But even if you cannot make it into a career, find ways to spend time on, on things that make you happy. It's very important. Very well said. And especially from an from a immigrant's perspective, coming into a new country, you're trying to make a life for yourself and you get just focused on how can I make money? How can I get another job? How can I provide for my family? Sadbhai, if you have to give an advice to your 20-year-old self, knowing everything that you know about life right now, what would that advice be? That advice would be to not have self-doubt. A lot of the time, I think it's just me growing up, I would be my biggest critique. And I would just tell myself that, oh, that thing is not possible or you are not good enough to do that. I think later on, I realized that I had bigger goals. And, and yes, there was doubt in my mind where I thought that I cannot achieve them. But later on, I realized that, oh, maybe I can. There's a path that I have to follow. And then those are not unachievable dreams. But then in the beginning, I was self-doubting a lot and I didn't have belief in my abilities. A lot of the time, people from outside told me how good I am. And then I would think that maybe they're not serious. So I think if I were to go back, I would 
uh, eliminate that self-doubt thing that I used to have and not give myself that chance because now we're living in a, in a time where a lot of the time people will bring you down and you have to basically pick yourself up and you have to make sure that you stay in a positive state of mind. I was lucky growing up that I had some good people around me who were giving me all those positive vibes where they were helping me to get up and achieve those certain things that I wanted to achieve. But if they were not around, then I don't think I would have uh, even thought of going into this direction of following my passion and stuff. But if some pe people do not have those kind of people around them and support, they have to be mentally strong and and they have to, in their mind, not doubt themselves. And again, uh, we spoke about it earlier as well, that don't be afraid of failing. Don't uh, make the serious thinking based on thinking that, oh, if I fail, four or five people will laugh at me. And it's just part of the journey. They People may laugh at you one time, two times, three times. But if you keep failing, you keep improving. And eventually you're bound to have success. And once you have success, all those failures would, the same people like who were laughing at you would now, would come to you and would ask you for help and advice and how did you end up achieving it. So don't make decisions based on how other people uh, would perceive you or think of you based on, make decisions based on what's good for you and what you feel basically doing. Because everybody's on a different journey. Uh, and you have to understand that you're on your own journey and you have to, you should be responsible of making your own life decisions, basically. Yeah, a lot of good points you said there, right? It's come back to that extreme ownership. You are responsible for your own life and you have to be your own cheerleader. If you don't know what you're doing and you can't cheer yourself on, maybe nobody else is going to do that as well. And I love that having that strong group of people around you. A lot of times we underestimate ourselves and we overestimate others. So I think you have to trust yourself and, and believe and have no self-doubt. You touched on it a couple of times, mental health. It's a big thing in general lives as an athlete. What do you do to stay mentally fit in your day-to-day? -day? So basically, again, I think mental toughness and everything, it also, it's a muscle where you have to exercise it. So you have to put yourself regularly in an uncomfortable position where you working that muscle to get tough. So you have to do uncomfortable position things on a daily basis. It could be taking an ice bath. It could be going to the gym and giving your best and running on the treadmill for as long as you can. So when you do those little things slowly, you're basically teaching your mind to be mentally tough. So whenever you are in an uncomfortable position, how can you stay relaxed and focused on whatever task you have on hand? Something that may work for me may not work for you. Some people to do yoga, some people to pray, meditate or pray. You have to find what works for you. And at the end of the day, you have to accept whatever result come out of any situation. You have to have a belief in God. The effort is the only thing that you can do. So you give 100% to everything. And then the result, you leave it up to the Almighty. Basically, what then whether it's a failure or a success, uh, that's just part of the journey and you have to be satisfied that you gave your best in that moment. So I think when you have a strong connection with God and you understand that you have given your best and whatever situation that comes, you accept it and your heart is at content, then mentally you will be okay to accept whatever results have come to you. But if you are solely focused on just winning and only having good things in your life and no one no failure or no negativity to ever come to you if you're only taking life as that then obviously that will be mentally draining to you and then you will have that that feeling where your purpose has not been fulfilled and you'll be in a grumpy state as well so i think it's very important to have a good understanding of the whole journey of failures and success that it's a part of journey and you have to accept the results and you have to keep moving forward i think if you understand that whole uh, cycle of life, I think you'll accept failures as well as you will accept um, the success. Control the controllable and enjoy the journey. Not just getting to the destination, but enjoy the journey. Legit. Uh, Saad, how would you to use your platform to give back to the community? So I think I have a role of being a mentor in cricket right now. The, the cricket uh, circle that we have right now, there's a big gap between under-19 Canadian national team and the senior national team. Right now, when kids play up to under-19, there's a gap and they don't understand 
how to get to the next level and how to stay competitive. So for me, I feel if Canada is doing well at the national level and then we get to a point where we get good fundings from ICC and also we get uh, government support, we can start this a high performance center where people, you identify young athletes who have the potential to represent Canada. Then you put them in that high performance center where you can train them into their next transition of going into the men's national team. As a leader of the Canada team, I want to make sure that we do well on the international level so we can get that kind of a support and focus. And at the same time, I want to be a mentor to all the young cricket and then advocate getting good coaching at an early age, things that I missed out on. And I want the youngsters not to miss out on those opportunities. I think getting, working on your basics and understanding the game at an early age is very important. So I want to use my platform, helping youngsters to do the right things at right stage and making sure that the mistakes that I've done along the journey and things that I've learned at a very late age, they understand and they learn at an early age, so they don't have to go through the, whole, the experiences that I've gone through basically in the past. Wonderful. And I think you're on the right track with it. Sadhguru, I just have a couple quick sort of rapid fire questions. So I'm just going to go through them quickly here with you. So Saad as a baller or Saad as a batsman? Saad as a baller. Your favorite form of dismissal? That would be bold or even stumping at getting the batsman deceived in the area and then getting stumped. Yeah. Yeah, that's lovely. That's yeah, fooled yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite shot? Extra cover drive. I love playing that. That's awesome. Your most cherished wicket? Stai the Freedy. <laughs> <laughs> the golden <laughs> duck. Your favorite fielding position? I usually stand on extra cover, so that would be my favorite fielding position. Awesome. And who do you think, if you have to name one, is going to win the 2023 ODI World? Right now, I think India is the favorite. So I think India, but now I feel Australia has a slight chance as well. So India or Australia, I would say. Yeah, I'm concerned about India's chances because they're playing New Zealand and we know what happened last time in New Zealand. Sadly, it's been a pleasure talking to you today, talking about the game that I so dearly love, understanding from you, your challenges, your experiences. I'm very confident that anybody who would be listening to this, the budding cricketers, our cricket fraternity, we're all really proud of what you guys are doing. And we want you to keep doing that. We're going to be rooting for you for Cricket Canada. And we're excited for what the future holds. Before I let you go today, any closing thoughts, any final words for the audiences? My message to the youngsters would be to believe in hard work and believe in consistency. There's a saying that goes that you don't eat the fruit the day you plant the seeds. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes you have to nourish the whole thing and water the plant. And sometimes you don't expect and see results right away, but it comes with patience and consistency. So you keep working hard. Even things are not working out for you at the time. You still believe and have the self-belief that it will eventually happen. So you don't let go of the consistency part of hard work. You don't only just work hard when you feel it or when you're passionate about it. You also put in the hard work on the days when you don't, things are not going your way and you don't feel putting in the hard work. And I think eventually, if you stick to that mantra, God will eventually give back to you for all the hard work that you have done. There's a saying that the hard work don't go into waste. You will eventually be successful and reap the rewards of whatever hard work you're putting in. So my message to you, to, to all the youngsters would be to Believe in hard work and believe in consistency and patience. Things will happen. Sometimes it takes time, but eventually all things will work out for you. That's wonderful. Thank you for your time today, Sadbhai. Thank you for sharing your journey. We absolutely loved it. We'll talk to you again. Thanks a lot for having me, Ravi.